Welcome, everyone, to Enron Gas Services Solutions Day. Guilty verdicts. Corporate America changed. If our work environment were stable and unchanging, routine would be fine. But in EGS, change is constant. With the suicide, dozens of guilty verdicts, thousands of job dismissals, billions of dollars lost, who was America's most innovative company? And how did they seemingly disintegrate overnight? The seventh largest company in America at the time and worth over $70 billion at its dizzying peak, Enron, known as Wall Street's darling, revolutionized the energy market. However, as the old saying goes, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. This is how greed made Enron one of the biggest scams in US history. That's our vision. Now we're trying to change the world. In the bustling energy market of the late 90s, we begin in Texas, where oil wells line the landscape and the air tastes of sand. With the dot-com boom looming, charismatic CEO Kenneth Lay painted a picture of endless profits and boundless innovation, luring investors with the whispers of a new economy. Enron started small, a humble merger of two North American gas pipeline companies. Lay led the company with ingenuity, and within a few short years, Enron had quickly become the largest natural gas supplier to North America. With the internet becoming ever more powerful by the day, Lay sensed immense opportunity, one which could make him and his company billions if he did this right. The decade prior had seen a wave of deregulation in the natural gas sector, allowing companies like Enron to trade directly between producers and consumers, or gas companies and the everyday American, something which had potentially passed everyone with little fanfare. Not Lay, however. Under Lay's guidance, Enron quickly established a dedicated trading arm, Enron Gas Marketing, and, using its extensive pipeline network and expertise, they hired aggressive traders to develop and innovate new trading strategies. Wall Street swooned. Investors, blinded by the promise of untold riches, threw money at Enron like a rigged roulette wheel. Presumably, to slip past regulations, Enron was one of the single largest known contributors to the George Bush campaign. Lay was affectionately known by Bush as Kenny Boy. The stock price fueled by Lay's charm and a seemingly endless stream of revolutionary financial instruments rocketed to over $90 a share, a testament to the Enron-backed dream. In 1999, Enron launched Enron Online, a revolutionary online platform that helped energy trading between various participants. Imagine a virtual stock exchange, but instead of stocks, you traded megawatts, barrels of oil, and even the weather itself. It was a gambler's paradise, a playground for energy speculators, and Enron, the self-proclaimed king of the kilowatts, stood at the center. Enron was worth over $70 billion at the time. But Enron's financial reports were a house of cards. To fuel their rapid growth, Enron relied heavily on creative financial instruments, including off-balance partnerships, which are entities hidden from financial statements. These instruments, planted as innovation, were elaborate illusions, smoke and mirrors hiding the billions in debt and losses. Off-the-book partnerships with names as opaque as their purpose, Justicom and Lie Heap, became Enron's little secret a labyrinth of shell companies designed to deceive investors and regulators alike. Lay, at this time, resigned as CEO, and Jeffrey Skyling, one of Enron's senior team, stepped into the role. In the summer of 2001, a lone whistleblower by the name of Sharon Watkins, a young Enron employee, stumbled upon the truth. The numbers didn't match, and the partnerships all seemed like a fraud. She had to act, her conscience becoming too great to ignore. Her now legendary memo, addressed to Lay himself, became the first tremor in the coming earthquake. Skyling, reading this memo, was deeply troubled. Sensing great danger about the company's financial doings, he abruptly resigned, with Lay stepping back into the helm. Drunk on their own success and Lay's unwavering insistence that everything was going great, they ignored the junior's warning. Their party continued, fueled by ever more desperate accounting tricks and a corporate culture that valued audacity over honesty. 
until one fateful day, the music stopped. In August of 2001, a domino fell. Lay reported that Enron's broadband division had taken a massive $137 million loss. A huge course correction from the once perfect company. Credit rating agencies downgraded Enron, spooking investors and sending the stock price plummeting to a 52-week low of nearly $40. Panic sets in. Newspapers start digging, analysts scrutinise, and the truth could no longer be contained. The off-balance sheet partnerships, the hidden losses, the web of deceit, it all came spilling out, painting a picture of Enron not as an investor, but as a colossal fraud. The fall was as swift as a tsunami, helped in no part by Enron. They reported an added loss, one much larger than expected for the third quarter of 2001. Some $638 million, a once again stark contrast to their sparkling image. Investors, betrayed and enraged, dumped Enron stock, plunging it further and alerting the SEC in the process. Noticing this unexpected loss in a market they had been previously blind to, a swift investigation was launched, tarnishing Enron's already suspect reputation additionally. Details of Enron's off-balance sheet partnerships, used to hide debt, trickled into the light. These partnerships, designed to mislead investigators and regulators, ultimately proved too complex to continue. The game was up. The price, once a symbol of market euphoria, plunge to pennies on the dollar. Enron, the once mighty giant, was brought to its knees. Filing for bankruptcy in December of 2001, the largest corporate collapse in US history at that time. Livelihoods evaporated, thousands lost their jobs, retirement savings vanished, and the ripple of Enron's collapse spread like wildfire, shaking the foundations of the entire financial world. Even with Enron bankrupt, no one could predict it would do any more harm. But Enron refused to be laid to rest. A former vice president of Enron and prolific trader by the name of Cliff Baxter knew his time was up. Having resigned from Enron in May of the previous year, citing ethical concerns, Baxter was called up to testify in court following the collapse of the giant. A friend of Skyling's and often present on his wild company trips, Baxter was of known interest in the case. He decided the best thing to do was nothing. He quietly gets into his car, takes himself down to a local parking lot and proceeds to unalive himself. Following the completion of the court case, dozens of verdicts were all identical. Guilty as charged. From senior members to executives, convictions ranged from counts of fraud, insider trading to money laundering. Former executives Lay and Skyling were both indicted on various charges, with Skyling receiving 24 years in prison and Lay passing of a heart attack months before being sentenced. Skyling, due to legal issues, faced a resentencing which reduced his overall sentence to 14 years. He served 12 of those and was released in 2019. Ironically, it was President Bush who would do the most in the wake of the scandal, signing into law an act which heightened the consequences for destroying, altering, or fabricating financial statements and trying to defraud shareholders. If you found this interesting, click subscribe, and another story that you might like is the odd one of the cursed royal family of Monaco. <laughs>